Um, uh, my name is Josh Tarrant. I'm the Associate Dean of Research and Innovation at the school. I'm also an Associate Professor of Architecture. And uh, with me today is uh, Dr. David Montaigne. He's our Graduate Program Director. And also, um, are you, you're almost a full professor. Uh, I, I think, well, I think, on a, is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm up for full this year, yes. Right. So I, I'll, I think I, I would hope to say these imminent, imminently a full professor uh, uh, in the architecture program here in the faculty and, uh, and uh, the emphasis on, on history. Um, but uh, today we're going to be um, talking a bit about uh, design-based research, a bit about the faculty, and, and a bit about our uh, Master of Environmental Design uh, degree. Um, it's a it's a unique degree within the, the various degrees that we offer here at the faculty. Um, it is a thesis based degree and it is focused on um, active research projects as much as possible. Um, and so we'll be talking about that a bit today. Um, let's see if we can click through this. So uh, we'll, we'll talk. Um, broadly about our approach, um, maybe one of the, the more prominent uh, facilities that we have, uh, we'll talk a bit about current projects, um, how that kind of intersects with uh, some of the other degrees for the course offerings, and then, um, and then uh, a bit about the variety of degree streams uh, that we offer and how the ME does sort of fits into that. Uh, so defining our approach, um, you know, while we're undergoing um, a strategic planning uh, exercise for the faculty. This, this has been our, our modus operandi for the past couple of years, which is really to say that our, our research is about addressing the future. It's about engaging industry and society and it's establishing lasting connections. So if you add up all of those things, it's really about having high impact research that makes a difference. You know, we're, we're certainly not a faculty that simply and solely uh, studies uh, uh, the, the world around us, but we, we like to play a very active part in that. So uh, there's a lot of um, different forms of research that happen under that umbrella, um, but we really do like to get our hands dirty often. Um, and that translates uh, quite well into the kinds of uh, industry, community, and, and government partnerships that we have in what we're doing. What we'd like to say is that the future is being designed here uh, with us. But what is design-based research? Um, you know, if you go across the university, um, actually quite a, a large number of researchers would have no idea what that actually is. Um, you know, there's other forms of research. Um, probably the most common one that, that we're all familiar with is evidence-based research. But design-based research is, is a bit different in that it has to do with iteration. It has to do with making things. It has to do with implementation. And then also being able to abstract that back out to uh, principles and theories. And this is informed not just by uh, things like architecture, planning, and landscape, but a whole variety of, of disciplines that go outside of SAPL. So we do a lot of interdisciplinary research, um, you know, uh, across the university and with, with other uh, institutions. Um, but, but really at the core, uh, we believe that design adds a lot of value. Design thinking adds a lot of value. Um, and it fits in really quite broadly with what the faculty is endeavoring uh, toward uh, lately. For example, next year we'll be launching an undergraduate degree program in, uh, in city, city innovation. The University of Calgary has a strategic plan around research and, and we abide by that. And it's actually, I, I think, kind of interesting to, to understand what that means. Um, it means that we do try to match our strengths with opportunities, which means our capabilities, our strengths being our facilities, our faculty members, our students, our areas of expertise, and actually try to, to match that with um, the kind of challenges uh, that are facing the world around us. Uh, it's also very important that our activities increase our research capacity. So the ME DES is a really key part to what that is. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a bridge between our master, you know, some of our professional master's degree programs and things like PhDs uh, and the DDES. Um, and it's also about uh, making sure that we're networking and connecting with other, other researchers, um, other schools uh, in order to, to do that. 
and that we're we are innovation focused. We understand that the world as it is currently is not structured to meet the challenges of tomorrow, and we are quite committed to trying to develop and contribute to finding those solutions. It's also important to note that, that the way that we do research is about serving stakeholders. And, and it's also under it really important to understand that students and faculty are stakeholders in research projects. And in a sense, first and foremost, they're the, they're the, the most important uh, stakeholders. Uh, and that's an important thing to communicate to incoming and, and uh, continuing students. So we ask the following questions in order to sort of vet our research projects. Um, we ask how it serves faculty research objectives and provides high quality learning opportunities for students. We ask how a project might, might serve to provide interdisciplinary research opportunities across the university, other academic institutions and other project partners. And of course, how does a we ask how a project can actually contribute to the innovative and impactful transformation of cities in the designed environment. So if, if these three sort of stakeholder entities are clearly met and mapped out in a project, we, we take it on. And, and I mention all of this because the ME DES degree really is about um, finding, you know, being involved in research projects. Um, it's important uh, to have that kind of experience and whether that's coming from a faculty member or whether it's generated through your own, your own uh, activities as a, as a student, uh, we think that it's a, it sort of defines the ethic of the, of the faculty. We do have a, a series of, of themes that uh, can be sort of traced across um, the faculty. We have um, systems and scales of urbanization, design landscapes, planning sustainable cities, and innovation and practice. And broadly speaking, this, this maps across uh, the three professional degree programs and then also looks toward um, a really important factor uh, within the faculty that we have a lot of practicing professionals uh, involved in what we do. Um, so architects, planners, landscape architects. Um, and so the notion of contributing to innovation and practice is also a form of research that the faculty recognizes. Um, the City Building Design Lab um, is uh, a facility that we uh, began occupying back, uh, I believe it was 2019, although we were we were physically present there in 2018, uh, it just officially opened in 2019. Um, and it's it it's in the former Central Public Library, uh, right next to the City Hall C train station. Here we have about 25,000 square feet of space across two floors. It has classrooms, design studios, digital fabrication equipment, conference rooms, public event space and a, the city's only city building gallery. Um, and here what we do is we take on a lot of our community engaged and industry engaged uh, research activities uh, in order to explore new directions in the design, construction and management of cities. Uh, so here you see a workshop um, in uh, robotic drawing uh, that was taking place a couple of years ago. Uh, and since then we've had a just a massive number of projects that sort of posted through that space. I, I bring up this slide because you're actually able to see some of the targets uh, that we're able to, to chase there uh, in terms of students served, industry partners, number of projects. And we've, you know, even despite COVID, we've actually uh, outperformed um, in all of those areas. Uh, it's just a massive front door for the city to come to us with their challenges and for us to be able to uh, collaborate with them to co-create new solutions. Uh, current projects. Uh, there's there's always new projects coming on. Um, we were we are literally uh, in many many ways uh, running very close to our capacity uh, in the faculty. We're not a huge faculty, uh, but we absolutely believe that we punch above our weight. Um, we do uh, really a lot of high profile projects uh, that are highly visible to the public. Um, aligned with uh, really important strategic objectives of the city and of industry. And we really believe that Calgary is a, a really great platform to explore and prototype uh, versions of, this, of cities of the future. So you can see things like um, high performance building facades, um, uh, a Center Street LRT platform project. Uh, Next Calgary is an amazing uh, program that one of our faculty members, Fabian Newhouse, uh, uh, runs. Um, the Civic Commons Catalyst has been a project 
Over the past two years, it's brought in uh, just about a million dollars um, in, in funding. Um, just an, an amazing set of, of things, and we'll, I'll just sort of touch on a couple of those. So the Civic Commons Catalyst is run by Alberto de Salvatierra. Uh, he's one of our younger faculty members. He's only been here uh, since 2020, I believe. So he, he landed amidst COVID um, and has been able to uh, work with in, an initial seed funding from the Alberta Real Estate Foundation, but has since expanded it uh, and, and franchise the endeavor to serve not only Calgary, but other Albertan cities, um, looking at uh, underutilized spatial assets within cities to explore new ways to use those spaces uh, to make cities more equitable and sustainable. Uh, it's, really, it's really an amazing project. It recently received three years of, of funding, a three-year funding commitment from the city of Calgary itself. Um, so that that's a a really um, uh, active project that we actually can, a lot of our other researchers um, uh, connect to, uh, myself included. Uh, I mentioned Fabian Newhouse. Um, he runs Next Calgary uh, uh, using uh, funds from the Richard Parker Initiative. Um, uh, it's quite focused on co-creation um, and exploring ways to uh, um, innovate and enhance public engagement and participation in the crafting of cities. And part of that that's sort of extended um, is, is actually this, this massive um, attention to, to learning and teaching. And uh, uh, Fabian, uh, Dr. Newhouse, uh, just received a, um, I believe it's a fellow position um, at the Taylor Institute here at the university, focusing on Talon, which is teaching and learning online. Um, and this is a book that was launched this fall uh, called Voices from the Digital Classroom. Um, uh, it's uh, edited by Sandra uh, Ablegan, uh, as, as well as Fabian um, um, and Kylie Wilson. Uh, so uh, really, really, I mean, really broad, interesting body of research. And actually, uh, Fabian right now is, is actively looking to hire onto that project. So it will very likely have some um, uh, uh, continuing SAPL students uh, hired onto that project. Um, there's also the future of Stephen Avenue. Uh, this is a set of, this is actually a program. Um, so we uh, were able to receive um, about $200,000 uh, of funds from the city uh, and uh, to explore and experiment and activate um, uh, Stephen Avenue itself. This is an image on the left of an LRT uh, car that was repurposed to turn into a community art studio. It's down um, by Loophole Coffee uh, at Stephen Avenue and 10th Street Southwest. Um, and and an amazing set of artists and researchers were involved in this project, and including Contemporary Calgary, Brian Faubert and Jennifer Iserman are the other leads on the project. Um, and uh, what's kind of amazing about the full set of the future of Stephen Avenue projects, this being just one of them, Another one was a transformative racial, racial justice workshop that was hosted um, in a space on Stephen Avenue. Another is concrete urban furniture, uh, where you see Alicia here uh, in, the, in the picture. Uh, she installed in front of the, the Globe Theater. Uh, we were able to, in two years, uh, uh, with $200,000 of funding, get another $200,000 of, of, uh, of value added to those projects. Um, so it's it's really a way to demonstrate that uh, research itself is actually a way to stimulate uh, uh, investment uh, in a community. Um, and it really translates into not just programming and, and the discovery of new knowledge, but actual the transformation of, of physical space. This is an older project called Pervanager. This kind of, this is from 2017 um, and uh, was involved in the Walk 21 conference. Um, you'll, you may actually see some of these parts floating around uh, the city still to this day, uh, although probably repainted and repurposed in some way, uh, but really was about imagining the ways in which um, urban spaces and particular streets and parklets could be transformed to kind of deprogram and deactivate uh, certain undesirable aspects of the city and to kind of inspire uh, uh, new forms of urban inhabitation. Uh, uh, of note, and we'll talk about industry placement a little bit, uh, this guy up here and this guy up here, uh, 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 were Emmy uh, um students um, and have since gone on to, to really great um, jobs following their time their time here. And then the last is 
uh, uh, just an image uh, that relates to uh, Alicia Namad uh, Vasquez's research. Um, she's an expert in robotic fabrication and AI and machine learning. Um, and uh, one of her projects, this was from a workshop uh, done in collaboration with Zahadid Architects uh, last summer, uh, but it translates into a, a body of work that she's doing in partnership with uh, dialogue design and Ferguson Glass on high performance uh, building facades. And that that's ongoing uh, work um, that continues to generate a lot of, of industry interest. Um, uh, really beautiful, amazing, formal, formal work coming out of her. Um, so lastly, before I, I toss it over to Dave, it, I think it's important to note that the, the research that we do in the faculty um, and the work that ME DES students are often involved in has a lot to do with curricular intersection. So as much as we've been talking about research up to this point, there's, there's a really important way that the faculty um, informs its courses through the research that it's doing and that the courses inform the research that then goes on. And oftentimes uh, the students uh, who are involved in that research uh, are able to be hired on as TAs and courses and the like. So there's a, a real way to sort of transfer knowledge uh, into the students that are coming into a variety of the programs. Um, and the way that I like to think of it is from the time that you are, a, 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 from the time you start being a student in any of our programs here, you're really a peer with, with us and the, and the rest of the faculty working on these problems together. Um, so whether that's being out in the field doing work, whether it's doing uh, lit review or whether it's writing or whether it's TAing or whether it's studying in a course, all of these things kind of flow together to kind of uh, help advance the, the transformation of cities. So you can see some of the lists of um, uh, these courses uh, that, that do directly relate to um, the research that's going on uh, under our roof. Um, I really won't take too much time to sort of talk about this, but uh, um, there's, there's a lot of material coming out these days and information on our website about what some of these courses are about and what they've been, what they've been doing. So I think I'll turn it over to Dave uh, to talk a bit about the uh, degree streams. Okay, thanks, Josh. You'll still have to drive the yep, yep. the bus. <laughs> um, okay, so just talk a, a little bit about SAPL, which is what we call the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. Um, we so we have three professional degrees, Master of Architecture, Master of Landscape Architecture, Master of Planning. Those are accredited professional degrees, the sort of degree you want to take if you want to become a registered professional in one of those fields. Um, and then we have these three post-professional degrees that uh, are on the slide right now. The one we're talking about today in this uh, session, of course, is the Master of Environmental Design. We also have a PhD in Environmental Design, so that's sort of a traditional approach to a research PhD. Um, and then we also have a Doctor of Design, which is uh, intended more for uh, currently practicing design professionals who want to come back and develop a particular expertise while they are still, uh, you know, managing, running, participating in a, 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 pra a practice. Okay. All right, so um, the EMIDES um, is a, well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple different ways to approach the EMIDES. So basically it's, it's, it's a sort of 16 to 24 month master's degree uh, that culminates in a thesis, uh, a written thesis um, that could be very design-based. It could be more theoretical. Uh, it could be based on all kinds of different aspects of design research, as, as Josh alluded to earlier. Um, in those two years, uh, there's a number of ways to help you fund your degree. Um, there are some internal scholarships that we have uh, that would fund, say, part of um, tuition and expenses, things like that. Uh, those are competitive both at the time of entrance, but also, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, there there are awards you can apply for each year as well. There's some uh, master's level funding, say, from the Canadian government, but 
those ones are very highly competitive and and limited to uh, you know Canadian citizens and and permanent residents. Um, so mostly for the MEDES, we're looking internally and then also to uh, industry partnerships. So there's a number of uh, different organizations or say architecture firms, the city of Calgary, uh, institutions like that, that uh, sometimes partner with us uh, to fund research projects, which could include MEDES students. Okay. Uh, that would be under the under the rubric probably of a research assistantship. So some some funding brought in by a supervisor or other faculty member uh, that you can participate in as a research assistant. There's also then teaching assistantships. So depending on your background coming into the MEDES, say if you have a planning degree uh, previously, you might uh, be well suited to being a teaching assistant in the planning program. All of the professional programs have teaching assistant positions in studio course, design studio courses, in theory courses, technology courses, and so on. We also currently have some undergraduate courses that offer TA ships. Uh, and of, as Josh said, we're starting a new undergraduate degree next September, and those courses will also need teaching assistantships. So given that most people coming into the ME DES are coming from some kind of professional education background and possibly professional experience too. Um, they're well suited to being teaching assistants in, in a lot of these courses. Um, well, do you wanna to talk to this one, Josh? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's actually quite unique about the ME DES degree is that it, we see it as filling a, a necessary, well, let's say necessarily filling a gap that exists between something like any one of the first professional degree programs and something like a PhD. Um, you know, a PhD takes, you know, three to five years. Um, it's, it's quite intensive. You become uh, an expert in something that no one else in the world is an expert on, um, almost by definition. Um, and yet, and so of course, doing a PhD would give you a tremendous amount of expertise, uh, but it takes time and it's not necessarily something that is um, aligned with industry. At the same time, if you come out of one of the first professional degree programs, well, great, you came out of a, a great first professional degree program, it's accredited, um, but at the same time, there's not a lot of, there's not necessarily a lot of on paper distinction between you and your classmates that you would have graduated with. And so when you, when, you know, industry looks out and says they want to hire someone that comes in at entry level, they look to students coming out of those programs. Um, the ME does in many ways offers uh, students the ability to really upskill at, uh, very fast and to do so in a way that's generally um, well, often aligned with uh, an area that industry is quite in interested in, but knows that they do not have the capacity to do it alone. So what we found is that, uh, especially with our industry engaged uh, research projects, which are many, um, the students who are involved in those projects then go on to then work in those, either those companies or other companies that are very interested in those skill sets um, and it really accelerates your or elevates the entry point into industry. So, for example, um, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a project on designing out waste. It was part of the FP Innovation Scholar in Residence program. Um, there are some students that were looking at um, the circular economy and uh, the really uh, looking at um, uh, upgrading. Uh, really low low class, like class B and class C commercial buildings um, and, tra and transforming them to be more, uh, not just more uh, energy efficient, but also to actually be more spatially uh, beautiful, viable, enjoyable, healthy to be in. Uh, the students that were involved in that project, one in particular, uh, Kristen Forward, uh, completed the, the, her ME DES and during that time uh, published a paper or two that was presented at a couple of conferences. Uh, during her time, she was able to travel 
uh, out to Copenhagen uh, uh, to uh, meet with, you know, and sort of visit the, the firm that we were collaborating with at the time. Um, and by the time she graduated, she had a job offer from NBBJ, which is a multinational architecture and urban design firm, uh, where she took a position basically uh, as one of the leads of their, their sort of research and innovation division. Um, she's been, she started in, in their Columbus office. She's now operating uh, out of Seattle, uh, still um, uh, with MBBJ and still sort of leading that, that area of the firm. But it's actually quite remarkable that someone could come out of uh, what was effectively five years, four years of five years of school, which is the MARC program plus a year and a half of the ME Des degree and to go into a, a position like that. And that's not uncommon. Um, uh, recently, we had a, a student that I was supervising uh, that uh, was working on a project with, uh, with uh, Alicia. Um, and uh, when he graduated, he took a position at Zaha Hadid Architects um, out in London. Uh, but that's not uncommon. And these are all, these are all, this is just a smattering of some of the firms that uh, um, uh, our, our ME Des graduates had gone on to work at, uh, including the city of Calgary. Uh, and this is a constantly expanding list. I have not updated this uh, okay. in the past uh, six months. And there are absolutely new, new hires and placements coming out of there. So we really do understand that not only is the experience itself of the ME Des degree uh, something that uh, our, we, you know, our students enjoy and it absolutely helps advance our research projects, but also it, it does benefit um, uh, our, the students in terms of opening up the future for them. We like to think that the ME Des uh, really does enhance uh, a student's uh, ability to make a decision about going into kind of one of three directions upon graduation, uh, where it, it act, the degree helps um, elevate their, the position in terms of if they went to industry, it might, depending on the kind of project, actually uh, make them like a, a really strong candidate to go into uh, government kind, you know, uh, municipal or provincial or even federal government jobs, um, uh, especially if it relates to planning and policy. Uh, and then also, uh, it may actually be a stepping stone toward an, toward an academic career. Uh, if you really find that your strong suit is, is in that arena, it absolutely could be a way of of stepping towards something like a PhD. And uh, 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 Dave and I actually supervise a student uh, who completed the, the ME Des and went on to, who is now uh, working on her PhD. Um, and so uh, there, there's a lot of options that the degree provides, um, and especially in the context of the kinds of uh, funding opportunities, we believe that it's, it's quite an affordable and, and competitively um, uh, you know, let's say competitively affordable uh, 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 way to spend your time um, that, that can actually pay dividends on the back end in terms of, of job placement, um, industry or otherwise uh, moving forward. I, I um, see Mohammed has a question, but we'll, we'll, Mohammed, we'll wait till uh, the end. I wanna make sure Connie gets a chance to talk too. Yeah. How many, where are we at, uh, Josh? Uh, this, is, this is pretty much the end of this. Um, okay. So, you know, Good. this is, the sort of closing question I like to kind of pose is, <laughs> is you know, asking your, yourselves, like, how can you make the biggest difference and, and, and to actually, you know, consider the ME does as, as one way to kind of maximize your own impact. So that's, that's it for this. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll turn it, I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Connie. Yeah. So Connie is a current ME does or master of environmental design student and, uh, we wanted to get her in early enough because as I understand, she has to go off and TA <laughs> shortly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Take it away, Connie. Uh, thank you. I am having some issues. Let me know if it can't hear me or if it sounds funny. Um, I could try to connect on my phone. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's not great, but we'll see if great. we can get through it. You can kind of understand though. Okay, great. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions about the ideas, you can definitely ask me. Um, I can try to help as much as I can, um, but Dave are um, better experts in this. And of course, our admin great for that too. So reach out to me if you have questions. Um, so just to give a little bit of a background, I actually initially did the MLA program um, here at Sapple. So I did the landscape architecture. 
And upon leaving that, I took a year off um, during COVID. So I took the year off um, and I wanted to be able to, I guess, give myself a bit of an edge um, coming out of this relationship. It was so general. Uh, so I wanted to dive into something a little more specific, specialized, uh, which is why I decided to go into the ME DES program. Um, so how that worked, uh, I reached out to a professor that I had a good rapport with, and from there, uh, we connected and figured out a program. I initially had a MyTax partner as well, um, an industry partner, but that eventually sort of fell through. So make sure if you do want to have an industry partner to help with funding, um, to really uh, give yourself several options so that you have to fall back on just one fall through. I, my supervisor and I decided that um, it would actually be with my tax partner, which is why I don't currently have one, but if I could have, I probably would. Um, and um, so far, the experience has been pretty great. Um, I would say, as a tip, uh, to make sure that you are very sure of what you want um, keep in mind, this is a research program. So if you are expecting to come into this for work experience, um, that might be that might not be the best approach to this. So really do make sure that you have a heart as well. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, uh, is there anything else that perhaps students might want to know you guys can tell that I can talk about? And when do you need to leave, Connie? Uh, just for a little. Okay. So, well, I think, Josh, should we open it up to questions now? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. Great. I think one, one of the things Connie was saying, and she was a little bit broken up, but, you know, it's you, at the time when you're applying for the ME DES, you may not be totally clear on the research you want to do, and that's Partly that is a discussion and negotiation with a potential supervisor. You know, so I think one of the key things for an application process for any of the thesis based programs, so the ME DES or the PhD and DDES, is to be talking to potential supervisors, uh, putting your idea out there or the general area you're interested in researching so that you can start to shape that before you get here. Because you don't want to be spending the first, I uh, say, a year shaping that or something like that. Um, so start to start to be thinking about that now and talking to people about it. Okay. I think, I think to follow up on that, you know, being doing work in the ME does it's aligned with uh, a faculty with your supervisor's research interests is is quite valuable um, because supervision itself, uh, from a faculty perspective, is takes time and investment. And then on the flip, on the flip side, um, you you know, for a student, you want that supervisor to have expertise that contributes to your study uh, and to provide that kind of guidance. So um, it's it's oftentimes it's not just about an area of interest; it's also about the kind of skill sets um, that you might be able to bring to bear uh, to that. You know, part of what I think is kind of an evolving um, ethic in in um, higher education is that um, students themselves are also major contributors to what we're doing, and that's actually reflected oftentimes in in the way that the funding model works. Um, so yeah, I see I see there's a question um, uh, that talks about um, the portfolio and statement of purpose. So maybe I'll I'll take a stab at at, at answering that, and and Dave, you probably have some some thoughts on that as well. But um, I, I do think that uh, having it, I'll just sort of go line by line. So uh, first to the portfolio, I think having a portfolio that really shows your strengths um, and your sensibilities is is quite important. If um, if the work that you've done um, is is largely visual and and design based, make sure that that's in there. It also is really helpful to be specific about the role. That that you that you yourself played on projects, especially if they're collaborative or professional in nature, um, uh, a statement of purpose um, uh, I think is 
is really helpful if it helps bring focus to, to what you're doing. So if, you know, let's say you've had like, uh, I don't know, two or three or even five years of time and uh, 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 whether it's studies, professional work, doing this or that, and, um, and you think that the ME DES or studying in a particular area of the ME DES would actually, that helps bring all of that into focus. Um, it helps us understand what you're, what you're submitting. It helps us understand that, you know, the idea of coming and doing a degree is not necessarily um, a way uh, um, to make, make sense in a way that you don't understand beforehand, but actually that, that you can demonstrate that you have an understanding of yourself and for yourself and how the, the, the degree actually uh, fits in with all of that. Um, so, you know, for example, the, you know, a, a lot of times, at least uh, in our lab or the lab that I'm involved with, uh, students might have an interest in digital design and fabrication broadly, um, but their, their thesis ultimately becomes about something far more specific. Um, so whether it's about material performance, whether it's about a di particular digital design tool, whether it's about a particular kind of building typology, um, those things generally get sussed out um, in the, in the, depending on when you come in, uh, in the, it, you know, in the first term that's happening. Um, one of the things about the ME DES degree, based on the timing, um, is that some students can start as early as the beginning of the summer, um, where they're just brought in and they're just working on research projects um, before they're ever taking any courses. And then the fall is used to, uh, you know, start to develop, um, you know, uh, the, the thesis itself. So lit review, writing skills, all of that kind of stuff. So, so typically by December of the first year of the ME DES program, someone will know quite clearly what their thesis is going to be about. Uh, whether you start in the fall or whether you start uh, in the spring summer, um, you know, is really just a difference of, do you start by being involved in a research project uh, or not? And usually, um, it does, you know, to be hired onto a research project, there does need to be some awareness of, um, uh, you know, what, what a, a student can do uh, on those projects. Um, and then the, lastly, to kind of to build on Dave's point that he was just talking about, you know, reaching out and connecting with a potential supervisor is really, really useful. Um, so um, that's where you can kind of share uh, or start a conversation and say, hey, I'm interested in this kind of area. Here are the skills that I have. Here's what I'd like to come and study. Um, would you be interested in supervising? Do you have any capacity for it? Because um, I, in my mind, in my experience, I think that ME does students that have a, that know kind of who they want to be supervising and, and that, that conversation has already started prior to the application works a lot better than someone who applies and then you know, then it's a conversation about, well, you know, is there a supervisor to fit? Um, and uh, it, it helps sort of uh, familiarize yourself with the culture of the school to, to actually see if it's going to be the right thing to do for you and, and on the, and the supervisor on their side to see if uh, it's the right thing to, to, to have that fit um, on the other side of things. But, uh, but yeah, it's not absolutely necessary. I think it just works better better that way. Dave, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, yeah, I would say if you could rank them like if you've talked to a supervisor and you can say that in your statement of purpose, your proposal for the application, that's that's the best. <laughs> if you've researched potential supervisors and you can say in your statement of purpose, I'm interested in working with this person or that person potentially, you know, they have synergies with with my interests. That's the second best. <laughs> you can apply, especially to the ME DES, you can apply without having secured, you know, a supervisor without having talked to a supervisor. And if that is the case, what would happen is so we have an admissions committee. If the admissions committee thinks your application is is good, that you're potentially admissible, then we would what we say shop around <laughs> your we would say oh based on your statement of purpose it sounds like they might be interested in, you know they might work well with such and such a supervisor and we'll show that supervisor your your application and try to find a supervisor but it's never 
a guarantee, of course, because as Josh said, sometimes people don't have capacity, sometimes they're going on sabbatical, you know, all those sorts of things, right? So there's a bit of a negotiation uh, that happens if we decide that you're admissible. Um, the, the, there's another question about the portfolio from an urban planning background. I would say that with the MEDES, because it's a thesis based, it depends a little bit as I think what Josh was saying, it depends a little bit on the type of research you wanna do as to how important the portfolio is versus how important say a statement of purpose is. Um, so if you're if you're looking to do like you know really design oriented research or in the robotics lab or you know things like that, obviously you're going to want to show us in a portfolio what you can do. Um, if you're looking say at more I don't know policy research or uh, you know ethnographic work where you're going into a community and interviewing people about something they're in, you know how they feel about the space or things like that that that's a bit more. Uh, you know, your statement of purpose is probably going to be more important because you're going to be, you're going to have to say in text <laughs> why you want to do it, what you can do, those sorts of things, right? So it depends a little bit on, on your application. I did want to circle back to the first question from Larry before Connie leaves here, which is what is the housing situation like? I know a lot of our, so we do have, there are, is uh, a graduate residence on campus, a relatively new building. Quite a few of our students, both in the professional programs, but also in the post-professional thesis programs live in there. And there's also family housing on campus. A lot of our students have lived in that if they have families. Uh, but also Connie, what have you been hearing from the other thesis students around the housing situation? So um, apart from the house, on campus, a lot of rented the place. Um, another student, if you else is also here in Calgary, um, of course, then I would highly recommend renting together. Um, a lot of them typically rent uh, in the neighborhood town or neighborhood Sunnyside. It's just really quick to get to campus from both of those locations. So, um, but other than that, I think that kind of covers. Yeah, we are, there are, um, you know, there's definitely, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't say in Calgary quite a crisis the way there is in Vancouver and Toronto for rental housing, but it is certainly, uh, it's it's a little bit competitive right now. So you may end up having to, you know, get roommates or something like that. Um, but, um, okay. There's a whole bunch of questions coming up now. Um, the follow-up question on the portfolios, is the portfolio optional? I believe with the ME DES and PhD, the portfolio is optional. Alexa, do you remember? Let me just go and double check. Um, yeah. I think that we have just put it as, an, as a component like that is required. I think it was optional in the past. And maybe I can jump in and answer some of these questions. So yeah. <laughs> I think I, so, you know, to follow up on the portfolio question, you know, there, there are some researchers that are, that are more design forward in their research um, in terms of like objects and stuff, but, but there, there are absolutely other kinds of research activities that don't necessarily translate in that way. Um, um, uh, and then the, the other question about international students, yeah, if if you're a student, you are. It's possible to be hired, um, but uh, you know I think the key thing uh, in a lot of that has to do with physical presence, um, uh, and effectively sort of being being here to be able to be hired on onto projects. Um, but yeah, wh wh where you're coming from um, has no bearing on uh, whether whether or not you can qualify for a position, as long as you're a student. Um, uh, in one of our programs, uh, and uh, and you are here, uh, then it is uh, possible to be hired onto research projects. Yeah, that's a good question. It's probably a good moment for me to interject since the question was about uh, Dr. Newhouse's uh, research, <laughs> um, and he's specifically looking for some people 
who are interested in food systems research, so food systems in the city. He's got a funded project that is just starting up and he's looking for MEDES stu PhD students uh, to participate in that. Um, in addition to, I think, probably also the, the Talon project that Josh talked about earlier, which is more about design pedagogy uh, and online learning. Uh, so he's got a couple of irons in the fire, as we say, <laughs> a couple of things going on um, with open positions. And certainly, uh, yeah, international students can work in TS, teaching assistants, research assistants, anything on campus like that. Let's see. Uh, can I also add something about that? I would highly recommend because I've noticed a few my work who weren't able to get into Canada. Um, so they are still learning internationally um, because visas and immigration take a long time. So definitely take account for that if you are not in Canada currently, um, that there may be a long process to actually yeah. Canada, depending on. Yeah, that's a good point. In Canada, we've had a lot of problems with visas in the last few years. There's a big backlog. So um, it actually goes back to someone had asked about um, how long does it take to <laughs> find out if you've been admitted. Uh, I would, you know, you should expect a, it's going to take a couple months after the admissions deadline or after the application deadline. Uh, but certainly we will try our best to do it quickly, especially to allow the international students to start their visa process. Um, there is another question about whether it's in person or hybrid. Uh, the MEDES program. The MEDES program is an in-person program, uh, so you should plan on being here in person. The last couple of years, it has been sort of hybrid, partly because of the visa issues. So, uh, but and of course, partly because of the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we did do all of our courses online. The course that the MEDES students are in this semester has been online as well, although. For next semester, we're planning them to be in person, the, the courses. So it's been hybrid, just but just because of <laughs> circumstances rather than uh, in, you know a, a plan for the degree to be hybrid. So the intent is that it's an in-person degree. Scroll down. Alexa's, yeah, asking, uh, Alexa's asking, I don't know if this is from you, Alexa, or from uh, someone sent it to you. Okay. Does it ever happen that an applicant has a research idea that doesn't match the supervisor's projects, but they take them on because they like the super student's idea? Yes. Uh, that definitely happens, especially at the MEDES level, because, um, you know, with the PhD is a very long commitment, right? Especially for a supervisor, as well as the student. Uh, but it does happen sometimes that an ME does applicant is just a very strong applicant. Maybe they have a general idea of what they want to do. It doesn't really match, say, the supervisor's research, but the supervisor is like, okay, I, you know, this is something that we could work with. Um, supervisors tend to have multiple interests too, depending, you know, with their backgrounds, to research they've done in the past, research they want to do in the future, those sorts of things. So it's not always easy to predict what a supervisor will be interested in. I would say in general though, that probably have that matching uh, a supervisor with a student where there isn't necessarily uh, a, an overlapping research interest or idea probably happens more often with students who are already here <laughs> because it's easier for them to, you know, get to know that supervisor say or they get for the supervisor to get to know them through a research system taing those sorts of things josh has a question about the mitac stream yeah so to briefly describe how mitax works um so there, there are different MyTax programs. The, the program we use the most is the Accelerate program. 
And it is something that does have to take place in person. There is a global link program, which is about postdocs and PhDs. It's a little bit different. Um, but I think probably for the purposes that Emmy does talking about the accelerate program is the, the best way to go. In that, it's really a three-part formula. You need a supervisor, you need a student, and you need an industry partner. And generally, the way that it works is that um, the student, well, the the supervise the faculty member and the industry partner more or less have a discussion about um, a, the potential of a research project, and they just sort of craft it together. Um, they can be as brief as four months long. Uh, they generally work in four to six month modules, um, and you can sort of pack those out. Um, they, it's a, it's a, there's a really high success rate on the application. So it's relatively certain funding if an industry partner and a supervisor want to do it. Um, the earlier a student can be involved or, or can be, it can be understood what, who the student's going to be on a particular project, the more that that can, that student's interests and capacities can actually get built in. But often, uh, is the case that a, faculty member and an industry partner will craft a project and then go looking for a student to hire into it. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it's it functions like an internship. 50% of the time you're in the industry partner's office working on the stuff, but you're not a regular intern. The work that you're doing, whether you're on campus or in the, the industry partner's office, is the work of the research project itself. Um, and so that's actually what, what happens historically is that a company wants to be able to do something, move in a new direction, have a new capacity, but they can't do it under their business model. Uh, they basically collaborate with someone at the university who has an expertise in the area. That student uh, also comes in uh, and they, they build it out. And, and then when they graduate, uh, typically they will hire them in to that office and they'll have that capacity then. Um, so it's a way it's a way of innovating and growing incrementally through research. Um, and what it it pays approximately ten thousand dollars per module. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details about how the money works on the back end, but basically, um, you know, as a student, you make ten thousand uh, dollars for a four month module, and oftentimes for an ME Des. It's like a two or three module um, thing. So it comes with 20 to $30,000 of, of funding uh, for the student who's involved on it. So about $2,500 a month. Sorry, I just have to pop out now, but um, thank you for having me. Um, one has questions for me. All right, thanks for coming, Connie. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a I have a hard stop at eleven. Um, okay. I, I can I can hang out and answer more questions if people need it. Great. Well, before I jump off, I want to thank thank everyone for joining, um, and uh, really hope to see your applications to the program. Um, and again, I think my best advice for all of it is uh, reach out to potential supervisors um, and let them know that it's the ME Des that you're interested in. Um, uh, that can that actually will probably um, help continue to answer any questions you might have or bring a little bit more clarity into focus. Uh, and if not, if you just want to uh, submit an application and and see where it falls, that's cool too. Um, but uh, hopefully this session was helpful. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Okay. So yeah, I can stay around and answer more questions if you want. Um, one thing about I can say about contacting supervisors because <laughs> we're kind of in the midst of that that season <laughs> right now where a lot of a lot of people are contacting supervisors right now um you know I'm getting how many three four emails a day from all around the world uh from different people um so one thing I would say is that when you contact a supervisor the I mean Emmy does PhD these are research degrees so you should say in your very first email, like have a paragraph, something like that, talking about what your research interest is. Um, so a lot of people just send 
uh, an email that you know maybe has one line or a phrase saying I'm interested in sustainable design or something <laughs> that that's not specific enough for a supervisor to say to be able to look at your email and say this is, might be a student that I could work with right so you know you're coming to it as a applicant to a research degree you come with come to it <clears throat> come to your su potential supervisor with a research idea essentially not a whole 10 page proposal or anything like that but you know something to start a conversation um that's that's more than just a one liner um cuz the fact is we're just getting a lot of them <laughs> and to sort through them is really hard um so you want to see that someone's already starting to think about what their research could be that would be my piece of advice about contacting supervisors um thanks dave we have a question just um about who to contact so i have sent out the faculty list but yeah. are there specific people on there that aren't um accepting emmy des like are there ways that people would know um like what's the best way to kind of approach the faculty <laughs> i mean I think I I said earlier, like it's, it can be year to year as well, right? It's like if someone's going on sabbatical, they might not want to take on an ME DES student because if they're going to be away for a year and an ME DES is a year and a half, then, you know, so so that's sometimes a little bit hard to predict. Um, and we have a number of people retiring or leaving at the end of this year. So we're going to lose a bunch of supervisors. Everybody on the faculty list is approved to supervise at the ME DES level. Not everybody has a PhD though, to supervise PhD, but everybody could can uh, supervise ME DES. Um, some people will advertise. So for instance, Fabian has asked us to <laughs> let people know about the food systems research he's doing. Um, other people, I would say one way to look into it is there's various labs within SAPL. So the, the LID, the Laboratory of Integrative Design, Josh is a part of, but also other people, Alicia, Jason, and others. You know, the labs tend to have ongoing research projects. So they're often looking for students who can contribute both as sort of research assistants, workers, but also to integrate their, their own research and thesis with those labs. Um, but a lot of it really comes down to looking at those faculty bios, <laughs> bio biographies and web pages and thinking about, you know, what are your own research interests and, you know, <laughs> presenting that to potential supervisors. I mean, in, in a way that's, uh, unless you're in Calgary, <laughs> where you can actually knock on doors and try to introduce yourself to people, which if you're in Calgary, go for it, do that. <laughs> I do get people, you know, knocking on my door for for, the, for those purposes. But if you're coming from a distance, yeah, that's one of the only ways to do it is research the website and, and try to, you know, if you're really interested in someone, read a paper or two of theirs, <laughs> and then you can say that in your, your first email. You know, I read your paper on such and such, and I'm really interested in doing research on this related thing, something like that. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I'm just going to pop um, some links for those labs into the chat. Mm -hmm. Good idea. So have them. I hope that worked. If it didn't, I have a few more here. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for your questions and for your engagement in this session. And obviously thanks to our presenters today. Um, it's a really, really great opportunity for students. So um, we will send out this recording. So if you do have, um, you want to rewatch it, you have additional questions, you can contact us or you can even send it to people if you know that they're interested in this type of program. And there's a, a few of our labs there. Um, that we discussed today in yeah, the chat. All, all of those have all those labs have current funded projects that they're working on, right? With students employed. So um, and you know, chances are that's going to continue. <laughs> yeah. 
Great. Okay. Well, it looks like we've covered all the questions. So thank you, everyone. I think we'll wrap up the session here. Uh, thank you, Dave. Josh and Connie. And uh, yes, please email us at our um, admissions at sapl.ucalgary.ca if you have any additional questions. Thanks, everyone. And we look forward to seeing your applications, hopefully, uh, for ME Des. <laughs> Thanks.